Hi, how are you all? I hope you have enjoyed this week and sense the blessing from God. Tonight, I pray that God will continue to protect you and your family and that he will again give you his love, joy, and peace for this coming week. We have been studying the book of Exodus and tonight we are in chapter 13. I don't know whether you have observed something interesting in these chapters. I have observed that there are repetitive information in this last chapters of Exodus. And I discover that it is not because the author is forgetful and keep repeating himself. I learned that both chapter, chapter 12 and chapter 13 are to be read together. You know, there is an interesting structural formation in the writing. And this kind of structure is very popular in the ancient literature. It is called a chiastic structure and is used frequently in the Bible. This chiastic structure emphasizes the important points or themes in writings. Let me give you an example by demonstrating how it is used in chapter 12 and 13 of Exodus. First of all, let me read to you these um, sentences here first. These A, B, C, D, C1, B1, A1 are the sequence of, um, of Exodus 12 and 13. And uh, A is the first part, you know, B, second, third, fourth, and so on and so forth. Okay, and then I'll explain to you. So the first part um, of this body information is A. It is about God's first instruction to Moses about the Passover to protect the firstborn, recorded in Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 to 13. Second part is about first instruction to Moses about the feast of unleavened bread, and is recorded in Exodus chapter 12, 14 to 20. Um, just to remind you that Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the same. Okay, the third part, first instruction to the people about Passover to protect the firstborn. Exodus chapter 12, verse 21 to 27. The fourth part, it is the first historical event of Passover. And then the Exodus, and recorded in Exodus chapter 12, verses 28 to 42. And the fifth part is the perpetual Passover ordinance and the instruction was given to Moses, recorded in Exodus chapter 12, 43 to 51. And the sixth part of this body of information is about perpetual feast of unleavened bread ordinances. The instruction was given to Moses, Exodus chapter 13, verses 3 to 10. And the seventh part, the final part, um, is about perpetual firstborn ordinance to the people and is recorded in Exodus chapter 13, verses 11 to 16. So are you able to see the pattern? You know, the beginning of this body of information is A, and the end of this body of information, A1. They are instructions about Passover the protection of the firstborn. And then the second part, which is B, um, and also the next to the last section, B1, are instruction about the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And if you look at the verses closely, A1 and B1, besides including what is written in A and B, they have additional details to the instruction. And C, the third part, is an instruction to the people, not God to Moses, is from Moses to the people about the Passover. And then C1, besides the information given in C, it has additional details. 
about the ordinances. Again, go look at the verses, okay? And D, D only has one, one D. It does not have D1 because it describes the actual historical event of Passover and the Exodus, and it is the focal point, the main theme of this body of information. So all the things around it is A, A1, B, B1, C, C1, which are instruction from God to Moses and Moses to the people. And so they kind of gather around the focal point, which is D, the main theme of this body of information, which is the actual historical event of Passover and the Exodus. I hope you understand what I'm trying to explain, what I'm trying to illustrate. Okay, now let's go to verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. These two verses seem to be out of sync with the following verses. Why Moses insert these two verses here? Well, when sentences like these break the trend of thought in the body information, I learned that it is trying to emphasize something. Here, the emphasis is on the Passover and that the Passover is about redeeming the firstborn. God redeeming the firstborn of the Israelites and in redeeming the firstborn, God wanted every firstborn to be dedicated to him. And more detail of this is going to come in verse 11. Now, let's read verse 3. Then Moses said to the people, Commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing ease. Today in the month of Abib, you are leaving. When the Lord brings you into the land of Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites, the land he swore to your ancestor to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days, eat bread made without yeast, and on the seventh day, hold a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during these seven days. Nothing with yeast in it is to be seen among you, nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your bodies or borders. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead and that this law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time year after year. Here, it seems like Moses is again instructing the people about how to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover and when to commemorate it. However, if you look closely, Moses was centering the people's attention on the present, past, and future. Moses said, today you are leaving, meaning the present. And then he pointed them toward the future, to the hope that soon they will be living in the promised land, to the land that is flowing with milk and honey that was promised by God to their ancestor, which is in the past. Repeatedly, they were reminded to keep the Passover year after year on the 14th day in the month of Abib, which was mentioned previously. So what does this passage tells us? It tells us that God wants his people to make note of ourselves today, which is the present time, and then look back at the past where we came from to see how much God has blessed us, provided and protected us. And then 
look forward to where he promised he'll bring us, which is the eternal promised land. We are reminded repeatedly that at the meantime, not to forget these things, but to commemorate what he has done for us and what he has promised for us in the future when he comes again. And to help his people to remember, he told them what? To put a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead. What does this mean? Well, for the Orthodox Jews, they have been taking this instruction literally by putting small leather boxes with long straps with the commandments binding to the left arms and foreheads. But for us, it means to remember in our mind, which is the forehead, of what he has done and we are to do, which is our hands, accordingly in obedience to his commands. Now verse 11. After the Lord brings you into the land of Canaanites and gives it to you as he promised an oath to your ancestors, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with the lamb every firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it, break his neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. In days to come, when your son asks you, What does this mean? Say to him, With a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. This is a continuation of verses 1 and 2. So all the Israelites' firstborn animals and men were to be allocated for God. If they were clean sacrificial animals, they could be offered as sacrifices to God. Unclean animals, like donkeys, were to be redeemed with a lamb. How about the firstborn son? Are they to be sacrificed? Well, in the first Passover, a lamb was the agent to redeem the firstborn. You remember that? The lamb takes the place of the firstborn. Redeem actually means ransom or buy back. And you can read it later on in the book of Numbers. The tribe of Levites was dedicated to the Lord to take the place of the firstborn sons instead of the lambs. And this ritual mentioned here again is to commemorate their saving experience in Egypt at the Passover when their firstborn sons were spared by God. So these repetitive passages about the Passover, about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, about the ordinance of the firstborn, is so that God's people know that remembering what God has done for them. So why should we remember what God has done for us? There's a few reasons. There are a few reasons that I have discovered. Number one, give us a gratitude attitude. Reflecting God's blessing and intervention fosters a sense of gratitude in our hearts, helping us appreciate the good things in our life. And remembering what he has done also foster faith. So remembering past instances of God's faithful strengthen our faith in his ability to continue working in our lives and to provide for our needs. And it gives us encouragement. So during difficult times, remembering how God has helped us in the past can provide encouragement and hope for the future. And also encourage us to praise and worship God. Recalling God's deeds inspires us 
to praise and worship him, acknowledging his greatness and power. And it's also a testimony to others, sharing stories of God's faithfulness with others can serve as a testimony to his goodness and inspire faith in those who hear them. Overall, remembering what God has done for us helps us grow spiritually, deepens our relationship with him, and share his love with others. Now verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Succoth, they camped at Etham, on the edge of the desert. By the day, by day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar by of fire by night left its place in front of the people. These verses tell us that the Israelites were to avoid the area where the Philistine lived. The Lord did not want the Israelites to be discouraged by the Egyptian garrison, which is the military post that lined the shortest route to Canaan. So he sent them around by the way of wilderness of the Red Sea to the south instead of going along the northern trade and campaign route. You see, sometimes God sends his children the long way around situations, an approach that often seems illogical for us. But God's ultimate goal is to build up his people's faith through their experience of his mighty works. The Israelite went up from Egypt in organized military formation. The original Hebrew verb went up in verse 18, derives from number five. So this text could be translated, and the sons of Israel went up in groups of fives. That is, the people were divided into groups and divisions. The Bible doesn't really indicate the size of the division or how they were organized. But it is important to remember that Moses, who was a prince of Egypt, you remember that? And he was military trained and probably would know how to organize a large group in military formation. And we see that this term is used in Joshua 1, 14 and Joshua 4, verse 12 to describe the organization of Israel before crossing the Jordan River to take possession of the promised land. Well, the passage didn't say anything about being armed with weapon. It says they were ready for battle. Probably means that they have a defensive strategy by dividing the company in divisions in case of attack. The passage also tells us that they took the bones of Joseph with them, in which was an oath the brothers of Joseph made to him before he died. From this, we know that God's people keeps their oath. They kept the oath for hundreds of years after the oath was made. So how long is 430 years? We won't appreciate it unless we have a comparison, right? So if we subtract 430 with 2024, which is this year, uh, would be 1594. 
and uh, 1594 that year is around the time of William Shakespeare and the time of Elizabeth I just to name a couple can you imagine someone made an oath in those days and his descendants are still keeping it now for the Israelites, remembering the oath gives them hope of the future and reminds them of God's guidance and leadership during all these difficult years. And most importantly, reminding them that God fulfills promise that he makes no matter the length of time. The last two verses show us how much God cares for his people. He didn't stop caring for them after the ten plagues when Pharaoh finally allowing them to leave. Until now, only Moses had been the go-between for God and his people. Moses and Aaron were God's mouthpiece, but here God became visible and very near to his people to protect and guide them. God's presence was with them day and night. During the day, he was ahead of his people, guiding them with a pillar of cloud. And at night, he went ahead of them in a pillar of fire so they could travel day or night. What a God. He was like a protective parent hovering over his little children. Day and night, protecting and guiding them so they would not be hurt, lost, or discouraged. Happy Sabbath.